Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our COVID-19 webinars. I'm Wendy Spearman. I'm not going to be joined by my usual facilitator, Mark Sandler, today, but we really have a very interesting afternoon ahead of us. We're going to have our usual epidemiology update from Marianne Davies, and then very important, we're going to look at T-cells and COVID-19, and our speakers are going to be Dr. Wendy Burgess and Dr. Catherine Rowe. Graham Mankies will be our chair for today, and over to you, Graham. Thank, thanks very much, Wendy, and, and uh, from my side, welcome to everyone to uh, this afternoon's uh, COVID-19 ECHO webinar. Um, we, our first um, input is from uh, Marianne Davies from uh, UCT Public Health and, and the Western Cape Department of Health, and Marianne's going to give us the usual update on the epidemiology on COVID of COVID-19 uh, in the Western Cape and, and more generally in South Africa. So thanks very much, Marianne, um, and over to you. Um, thanks very much. If you can just let me know if you can't see or hear me, um, otherwise I'll assume that you can. So um, it's been almost two years since we've been showing you this graph. Um, and, and here we are four waves later um, with our standard integrated graph. Um, you can see on the right hand side, we've clearly come off the fourth wave in terms of all of our measures. What's notable is obviously that massive difference between cases in black and bulk oxygen use in the fourth wave, uh, speaking to the lower experience in terms of disease severity uh, due to the combination of factors that I think Hannah outlined at the last uh, meeting of both uh, population of immunity from prior infection, vaccination, and probably some inherent reduced virulence. This interwave period has been quite different from the previous interwave periods. And what you'll notice is that black line of cases is much higher than in the previous interwave periods. And the proportion positive has remained stubbornly at around 20%. And I'll talk to that in a little bit more detail. What we have seen reassuringly is the admissions have uh, finally dropped to interwave levels and the deaths are also at, at previous interwave levels. Um, in terms of the national trends, we've seen a very similar picture across all the provinces. So if you look at, at all the provinces, their post fourth wave has been at a much higher level than before the fourth wave, although admittedly that was the lowest level we had in the entire history of the pandemic. We've seen a couple of little upticks um, in Kaoteng, Free State, uh, Northwest and KZN, that these do seem to have settled, but we, we certainly haven't seen the steep drops that we've seen in the other waves. And just to show you that picture in the province, um, you can see that we've really been sitting at this flat place for an enormously long time with really no change in case numbers in the last week, although there have been the drops in admissions and in deaths that I've um, spoken about. And this persistent uh, positive proportion that, that just won't go below 20%, whereas in all our other previous interwave periods, it was definitely below 10% and often below five. You can see here that it's largely been driven by private sector testing. And we do see that our private sector testing is, is sitting more at around 25%, whereas the public sector proportion positive is more around 10%. So clearly quite different testing patterns in those, those two different groups and, um, and this curious high proportion positive. In terms of looking at uh, sub-districts across the metro, you'll see quite big percentages up and down here, but these are all on small case numbers, so really don't mean much, just talking to the flat picture, and really the same across the, uh, the rural areas as well. Um, really not much, much to see there. And similarly, the reproductive number you can see here on the left-hand side across the entire pandemic, you can see the massive surge at the start of wave four, but um, in this last period, it's really hovered around one for a, a very, very long time. It's looking a little bit downward today, but, um, but very much hovering around that, uh, that one level in keeping with the cases. And similarly, the forecast numbers are very, very flat. They're not forecast to go down, but just to, to stay the same. If we look, um, at the CT values, so which is effectively a reflection of the, the median viral load with low values indicating an increase in viral load. 
and generally a drop in CT in the past has indicated the start of a new wave. We do see nationally on the top left that values are dropping, that this does seem to be driven by a few provinces in particular, which includes the Western Cape, but more so KwaZulu Natal and Northwest. And so that's obviously a space that we are watching very closely, but we have seen in some other provinces a drop and then a subsequent increase with outer waves. So uh, a little bit difficult to interpret that data. In terms of genomics, um, Omicron remains dominant. It accounted for 90, 98% of cases in February, the majority of which were BA.2, which is shown here in the dark red. Uh, in the Western Cape, the picture is similar. What we are seeing in a couple of places is um, a few Delta, what appear to be Delta cases, um, although these are very sporadic and certainly across the metro, BA.2 remains dominant from our sequencing data. Obviously with the announcement of the recombinant so-called Delta Cron, a name that we all don't like very much in, um, in Europe and in a, a couple of other places around the world, there is concern of, are we going to see Delta Cron in South Africa? I think uh, important to note is that the cases globally have been very small in number compared to the Omicron and particularly the BA.2 cases. Um, we haven't identified this from genome sequencing in South Africa, but the network for genomic surveillance is really increasing their sequencing at the moment in order to make sure that we don't miss something should it emerge. And then if we were seeing an increase in either Delta or a recombinant that includes Delta, we do have from our previous Delta wave, this proxy marker that was developed for Delta, where on the C gene assay, you can identify Delta specimens through the fact that they um, take a long time to become positive for the RDRP target. So we have this phenomenon called RDRP target delay. And the Delta or Delta recombinants that have been identified globally, their genome indicates that they would have um, RDRP target delay. So if we were seeing um, an emergence of this, uh, these recombinants in our setting, we would have expected to see an increase in, in RDRP target delay. And at the top, you can see nationally the proportion of uh, C gene specimens with RDRP target delay, and at the bottom in the Western Cape, and we haven't seen an uptick in that. Um, but the caveat here is that the number of specimens being tested on the CG platform overall, because testing numbers are lower, especially in the public sector, is very low at the moment. And then finally, in terms of excess deaths, uh, there was a bit of an uptick nationally, going just above the upper bounds of normal. And we've actually stayed above the upper prediction bounds for um, the, the last couple of weeks nationally. In the Western Cape, it's an we've seen an increase, but it's very much within the prediction bounds, so nothing to be concerned about. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Marianne, for that uh, really uh, timely update. Um, th there's time for, for one or two questions. Um, uh, uh, Wendy, if you can just look at the chat to see whether there's any questions coming through. But uh, Marianne, if I can ask just an update on uh, vaccine coverage in the Western Cape and you know whether there are still people coming forward for their first uh, vaccination and obviously there are people uh, uh, sort of attending for boosters what what the current activity in that regard is. Um, so we're still seeing a, a slow increase in vaccine coverage. Um, mm. We're not, uh, but, but relatively few people coming forward for first vaccines. I think most of the activity now is around uh, boosters um, in particular, and, um, and, and that's going uh, a little bit faster actually than, we, than it started off and, and picking up. Particularly, I think there have been SMSs now going out to people who are due for boosters. Um, and with the opening up of heterologous boosting and obviously the shorter interval for boosting, we are seeing people coming forward. Um, but, uh, but still, um, you know, we do have a, a large proportion of people who haven't accessed their first vaccine, particularly in the under 50s. And then, um, Marianne, if just in terms of the testing numbers, as you say, that's declined in the, particularly in the public sector, um, does it look like there's there's even less testing being 
done than, than in the interwave, the previous interwave periods? Um, yeah, there is. I, sorry, I can't pull the graphic up um, immediately but, um, and, and share it. But yeah, the, the testing at the moment, particularly in public sector, is, is lower. Um, we also haven't uh, gone fully back to unrestricted testing post wave. That's still in, in discussion. And so um, I think the, the demand for testing is also lower. And, um, and with the change in isolation and quarantine requirements, there's also a lower demand for testing. So I think both across public and private um, testing is, is lower than in previous interwave periods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Wendy, no, no questions that came through? <laughs> no other questions at the moment. Okay, great. Thanks so much for the update, Marianne. Really appreciate it. So um, we're now going to move on to the main uh, presentation for this afternoon. Um, and the focus of that is on T cells in COVID-19. And um, I think everybody will be aware that the, the initial immunology studies in, in COVID-19 really focused on antibody responses uh, to infection and to vaccination. And there was some alarm you know, in 2020 uh, that uh, antibodies were waning with time uh, after infection and that that could, could mean that people would be at, at very high risk of, of, of reinfection um, and, and, and subsequent disease. But since then, there's been increasing realization of, of the role of, of cellular immune responses, particularly in protection against the severe manifestations uh, and death due to COVID-19. And this afternoon, we're going to hear from two local experts um, on the role of T, T cells in infectious diseases generally, but to hear about their work on T cell responses in COVID-19 uh, with respect to COVID-19 infection, as well as vaccination and coverage across the variants. Um, the the, uh, the um, speakers are, are Wendy Burgers and Catherine Rea, and they've recently um, led a study that was published in Nature uh, that looked um, at T cell responses to the Omicron variant. Um, so the first up is, is Wendy, and she'll be followed by Catherine. It's one presentation that they're going to give jointly. Wendy is a member of the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine at UCT. She's a senior fellow of the European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, or EDCTP, and a former Wellcome Trust Fellow. And she leads a cellular immunity subgroup of the National Variant Consortium and has recently been appointed to the Ministerial Advisory Committee on, on COVID vaccines. Uh, Catherine is a senior research officer and an associate member of the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine. And she's an immunologist and a flow cytometry expert uh, and a principal investigator on EDCTP and NIH grants. So we're really excited to hear this, this uh, presentation this afternoon. I think uh, everybody's aware of the importance of T cells in COVID-19. Uh, and that's partly due to the work uh, that's been done locally and, and really uh, interested to hear uh, about your work and, and this issue more generally. So over to you, Wendy and Catherine. Thank you very much, Graham. Can you see my slides in full screen and hear yeah. me clearly? Yeah, that's Thank all clear. You. Thanks. So good afternoon, colleagues. And we're really excited that other people are getting excited about T cells. Um, so um, I just wanted to mention the start that Catherine and I have consolidated our activities under a newly established clinical cellular immunology platform in the IDM, where we're performing fundamental research, generating new knowledge, and, and some of that we're going to present today. And we're also conducting um, T cell analyses for a number of ongoing clinical trials, testing different heterologous regimens of COVID vaccines, different dosing, um, even testing new vaccines based on different variants like Omicron and also looking at um, T cell responses after vaccination in immunologically vulnerable uh, groups um, where, where maybe modified regimens are needed for optimal immunity. And of course, we're also doing a lot of training of PhDs and postdocs um, in the highly specialized skills required to, to do this work. And it's through um, these three activities that we hope to be poised to rapidly respond to future pandemics also. So for today's presentation, we'll be focusing on T-cell responses to SARS-CoV-2 after both infection and vaccination. 
Um, we won't be talking about the role or the potential role of T cells in immunopathology, you know, whether T cells contribute to um, severe disease or pathology in severe cases, because that is far less well characterized. So we'll look at what the types of immune responses are that are mounted and also as we go forward, um, now that people have had multiple doses of vaccines and been infected or had breakthrough infection, how um, that's changing. Um, so these are not simple um, studies that we can do anymore looking at only vaccination or infection. And then in the second part of the talk, Catherine will um, look at in the context of variants, the emergence of variants, and what have we learned about how the T cell response is affected by mutations, which we know can lead to substantial immunization from the antibody response, um, thereby compromising our, our vaccines. And lastly, she'll de deal with these situations of immune vulnerability, such as comorbidities or co-infections that are common in our setting and how they affect the T cell response. But I thought what I'd start with is um, some fundamentals to remind you about what T cells do and what we know about their role um, from two years of, of studying um, SARS-CoV-2. But just first, I right up front want to acknowledge the many, many people who made um, the work that we're going to present possible um, and contributed to these studies. Key people are on the slide. I'm not going to go through them um, in my lab at UCT around the country and internationally, as well as our funders. And um, since many of these studies also have been performed in healthcare workers, um, including the cohort here at GSH, and maybe even some of you who are on the call, I really want to say to research participants who made this study possible, um, thank you for your time, sacrifice, and your willingness to advance the science. So, um, so while we're focusing on T-cells today, um, when we're considering their role in protective immunity to COVID, it's important to acknowledge that the immune system works in a coordinated way. It's not antibodies or T cells. So in acute infection, you need to engage both antibodies and T cells. And then in, um, in, when you're recovered, um, you want that immune memory, which involves both memory T cells and memory B cells. And there's also a battalion of different T cells. So teasing out which subsets are important for protection from infection or protection along the spectrum of disease from mild to moderate or severe disease is a whole nother issue. So you get CD4 T follicular helper cells, and these are cells that are specialized to um, provide uh, assistance to B cells to, to, um, uh, for neutralizing antibodies to mature and to get better at recognizing pathogens, um, also for the development of memory B cells and long-lived antibody secreting cells. Um, CD4 cells also promote CD8 cell activation and the formation of memory. And, um, uh, and there are a number of other specialized subsets that are involved in um, controlling the inflammatory milieu. So, so there are a wide variety of effector mechanisms from both virus-specific CD4 and CD8 T cells that can eliminate infected cells and, and control um, or limit the, um, the devastation from infection. So, so T cells are needed for B cell help and they're also needed for killing infected cells. This is generally CD8 cells that do this, but CD4 cells can also contribute with a direct antiviral role. Um, and, and they do this through, through clearing virally infected cells so, and, and thereby limit disease. And this last point is an important distinction that we need to make because um, their T cells are regarded as the second line of defense, but second line of defense doesn't mean less important. So neutralizing antibodies can provide sterilizing immunity. In other words, they can prevent infection altogether if they're at the required titer that's needed, so the required concentration, but also if they're recognizing the, the virus sufficiently. Um, in, in, in other words, that it's not a variant. Um, but if they're insufficient, you know, if titers are low, they don't cro cross recognize the virus, then T cells have to do the heavy lifting to limit the infection. And this figure illustrates why. So only once a T cell has, has once a cell has become infected, does that cell present viral epitopes, so small parts of the virus, 
two T cells that are specific for that virus, CD4s or CD8s. And it's through this interaction um, when the multiple effector mechanisms that T cells use can then spring into action to clear the, the infected cell and limit viral replication and spread. So I've been talking in general terms up to now, but what are the specific mechanisms um, of protection against COVID-19? So it's well established, and you probably all know that high level, long lasting neutralizing antibodies um, are important. Um, we know the virus is susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. We know also that most licensed vaccines have antibodies as the mechanism or correlate of immunity. And, um, and as I said, antibodies may be the only effectors that can provide sterilizing immunity, protecting you from infection. And a number of studies now, including this meta study here, um, suggest that neutralizing antibodies are predictive of protection. So here are the different vaccines and those with the highest protective efficacy also generated the highest levels of antibodies. We also know that there are multiple licensed monoclonal antibody treatments available elsewhere in the world um, that have a variable degree of efficacy. But there is also substantial evidence for the um, for a role of T cells in protective immunity for, for them contributing to this. Um, these come from observational clinical studies where the presence of virus specific CD4 and CD8 T cells has been associated with better outcomes in natural infection. We know in individuals, the few cases that have been described of individuals with A gamma globulinemia or B cell depletion as a result of certain therapies, that they have less, less severe disease than expected, not having antibodies or not having that arm of the immune response. Um, uh, several studies have, obse have observed the early induction of functional SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells associating with a more rapid viral clearance and, and a more mild a more, uh, outcome of disease. And then um, probably the best mechanistic evidence that we have comes from um, studies in rhesus macaques where CD8 cells are depleted um, and um, show, shown in this situation that CD8 cells can provide partial control of infection in these animals. But proving that, um, proving that T cells mechanistically are important is really challenging. So why, why can't we do that? Why hasn't it been done? So there are logistical constraints. So that's um, so, so when you study antibodies, you can look at serum or, or plasma, but you have to extract cells from blood um, in a timeless manner, store them down. Um, this is expensive, um, requires large longit longitudinal studies. Um, in order to have these specimens so that, you know, when you have an outcome like severe disease, you can go back to a, a previous time point and look at what the T cell response was doing. Um, the assays are challenging. They're more difficult to standardize, qualify, and validate. They're not high throughput and, and generally are, are quite specialized and expensive. Um, unlike with antibodies, passive cell transfer studies are not really feasible. And then it's even more difficult, as I alluded to, because of the complexity of the, the different subsets of T cells, the different functions, different effector mechanisms, and also their tissue location. So what I'm going to be talking about today solely, and Catherine too, is looking at immune responses in blood, but um, we're, we're very ignorant of what is happening at the tissue level where there are resident memory cells and where cells infiltrate. So um, in one slide, what have two years of COVID-19 studies taught us about the T-cell response to SARS-CoV-2? Well, you get strong T-cell responses, both CD4 and CD8 T-cell responses uh, generated in most people. They come up really early, um, two to four days after infection. Um, they target a large number of regions across the viral proteome. So um, for those, so after infection, around 15 to 20 different epitopes mounted in, uh, per person. Of course, in vaccination, that's um, concentrated on the spike protein. And we know that um, the structural proteins like spike or nucleocapsid are immunodominant, um, meaning that they are more targeted than other parts of the virus, but, in, but there is targeting across the viral proteome. Um, we see T cell responses in asymptomatic infection, in mild and severe COVID-19. And we know that the durability of the T cell response is at least nine months after infection and vaccination now. 
and probably lasts a lot longer. And in, in the first year of the pandemic, some researchers went back and looked at the original SARS that emerged in 2003 and caused a, an outbreak um, that was um, subsequently contained very well, as you know, and could find in um, volunteers who had been infected with SARS-CoV-1 17 years later, they could still detect T cell responses. So this bodes well for the longevity of T cell responses after infection and hopefully after vaccination. So for today's presentation, I'm going to get on to um, what we're going to present. Um, so um, none of this also would have been possible without the cohorts that we've been studying. So um, one of these is the healthcare worker cohort based here at Hoteskeel Hospital. Ntubeko Ntuzi is the PI of this, and he had the foresight to establish this very early in the um, pandemic in July um, of the first year. And it's a really extensively characterized and sampled cohort, enabling us to ask a range of um, important research questions. It consists of 400 healthcare workers. They were initially followed um, very closely monthly for the first six months. And um, as you know, um, healthcare workers were offered vaccination as part of the Sasanke trial um, uh, as part prior to the national rollout, in fact, um, and that occurred in February to May in 2021. And then uh, recently um, we were offered a boost. Um, so that occurred in November 21. And so we've been able to sample, um, take samples and in particular PBMC that we require to study T cell responses at um, really key times after infection and vaccination in this cohort. And we continue to follow them um, for longer. Um, other cohorts that have been extremely um, useful are um, hospitalized cohorts. So looking at the time of acute infection um, in patients who are hospitalized. And um, we've followed hospitalized cohorts throughout the pandemic. What this figure shows is the different variants that were um, that dominated the different waves. So the original, then beta, um, delta, and then omicron in the most recent wave. Again, uh, collecting PBMC, and this was through collaborations both here at GSH and um, around the country at um, Steve Biko Academic Hospital. Um, just one slide I wanted to show you to, you, you may not know how we measure T cell responses. So we isolate PBMC and generally cryopreserve them from blood. And then when we want to do our studies, we thaw them out and we have live cells, which we then stimulate or mix with um, peptides. So these are um, small 15 amino acid stretches that um, overlap each other and span the entire sequence, amino acid sequence of spike um, or nucleocapsid or any other protein that we'd like to look at the, the immune response to. Um, and what these encompass are all the potential epitopes that um, humans may target. And, and this allows us through um, flow cytometry to get a readout of the CD4 and the CD8 T cell response by measuring, by staining cells and measuring the secretion of certain cytokines. When we're looking at immune responses to variants, um, we do the same, but we introduce into our pool of peptides the mutations that, um, that have arisen in the different variants. Okay, so, so what have we found? So um, Roanne Keaton, who you see here, she's a mid-career fellow in my group who has headed a lot of the lab work, so I just want to acknowledge her. Um, so what she did was first characterize T cell responses after infection. And this was prior to vaccination. So this was after either the original, um, so these were um, 74 healthcare workers who either had a positive PCR after the first wave of infection, so the original ancestral strain, or after the beta wave. Um, so, it's, so, so we measured responses between one and seven months post-infection. And what you see here is the frequency of responders. So most 91% um, of the 74 um, healthcare workers that we tested had a CD4 response, fewer had a CD8 response. And these are the frequencies of responses. So then the number of cells essentially that we could measure. And you can see the, the huge um, spread. So, so sort of a, a two log spread of immune responses in people. Um, again, the CD4 response is um, uh, detectable at a higher frequency than the CD8 response. 
And what we saw if we looked at the time that we were measuring post the, the positive PCR, we see that these responses are really highly durable. So this is around six or seven months out from infection, and we're still getting really strong responses detectable, um, as I mentioned earlier. So um, based on, so we screened the entire cohort of 400 for um, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, and we had the data on, on their positive PCRs. And um, by the end of the second wave, which was in January 2021, 60% of the cohort had been exposed. And by now it's probably closer to 90%. Um, and, but luckily this was all mild or asymptomatic disease. And so, so that led us to ask um, some subsequent questions. And um, so after initial characterization of the response to infection, where the data that I showed you is very similar to what um, other cohorts around the world have found. Um, and so now we could ask that now that vaccination was introduced um, and now that multiple variants had arisen at this stage after the beta wave, we could ask the question, how does prior infection um, influence the vaccine response? And so we selected um, three groups of um, participants from the cohort, those who hadn't didn't have any evidence of infection. Uh, those who had been infected in the, the initial wave with the ancestral strain and those who had been infected um, with beta in the, in the second wave um, to look at how prior infection um, influenced the um, antibody and T cell response. And this study was performed um, together with um, Penny Moore and her lab at the NICD. I know she's given a talk here in the, in the echo calls before, and it was a really wonderful um, partnership that continues with all our studies now. So these are her data um, showing neutralizing antibody responses. And so the green is the, the group that didn't have any prior infection. So you can see there are no antibodies at baseline. Then the, the first wave infection and the second in pink. And what you can see that there's a, a, um, a de novo induction of neutralizing antibody responses, but they're boosted um, quite substantially or they're substantially higher in those who had prior infection, whether that was seven months before in the, in the original wave or um, just one month before in the beta wave. Um, the cross react that these are, these are neutralizing antibody responses to the ancestral virus, um, the one that's in the vaccine, the one that um, uh, was originally infected these, this group here. And what you can see over here, again, in the three groups, no infection, first wave and second, where she's measuring neutralization to um, the original virus, the beta variant, and at that stage, Delta had also emerged. And what you can see here is that um, there is still cross reactivity, but um, the titers go down considerably in terms of cross reactivity to um, the variants, in this case, particularly um, Delta, as it wasn't any of the variants that any of these um, participants had seen. And, um, and where there was no prior infection with just a single J&J shot looking one month after, there were many individuals who actually didn't um, cross-neutralize the variants at all. Um, oh. Sorry. I seem to have lost my share. Uh, can you still see the screen? Um, we've lost your screen now. Yep, it's back on. Okay, great. I'm oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong button there. Um, so for the T cells, um, uh, we found in the same three groups, um, these are CD4 responses, these are CD8 responses. And what you can see is a strong induction of de novo responses in those who didn't have any prior infection. Um, in, the, in the prior infection groups, you can see at baseline, they still had very strong responses from infection, um, which were quite moderately boosted. In, the, in fact, in the second wave group, um, overall, there were, there were some that were boosted, but overall, there was very little um, increase in the median response. And um, so, so we got robust CD4 responses, but really a, a different dynamic compared to the antibody responses with no, um, yeah, no significant overall boosting in that second wave, um, although lots of variation. Um, 
And then for the CD8 responses, we also got robust CD8 responses to vaccination one month after J&J. In all the groups, it looks quite different from the CD4 responses since there were far fewer individuals who had a CD8 response to start with. Um, and that was consistent with, um, with the infection data that I showed you before. In fact, 25% um, uh, of people had a CD8 response prior to, um, uh, so after infection compared to 90% for CD4s. And this, this is just summarized here where um, there's, where, where you can see the same kind of data, but I want you to look at the pies where it adds the frequency of responders. And so in the in those who had never had infection before, that much lower frequency of responders, but that once you get um, vaccinated, um, that goes up substantially so that almost everyone has a T cell response, a CD4 T cell response after vaccination, and far more um, individuals have a CD8 response. So, so this was, um, uh, sort of much earlier in the pandemic when we did that sort of more than a year ago and um, when we did that study and now we're moving into a situation where we have much more complex immunological landscape and what I mean by that is um, particularly since the Delta and Omicron waves um, we've had multiple doses of vaccines um, we've seen quite a lot of breakthrough infection particularly after the Omicron wave um, and so um, these uh, this is the same court, and now a number of um, participants in that cohort have had up to four exposures. In fact, we even have some who've had five exposures of spike um, in its different forms. And so what I mean by that is, is a combination of, um, of, of multiple doses of vaccines and prior or subsequent breakthrough infection after vaccination and and that's what this group four is so so what you're seeing here is cd4 responses cd8 responses and spike antibodies and um, where we've measured in people who've had either just one exposure so that's one infection or one vaccination two which is a combination of infection or vaccination or two vaccines three which is a combination of those and as i mentioned four and um, what we see here is something quite interesting and quite different from what we see with antibody responses. So if you cast your eye to the antibody responses in green um, on the right of the slide, um, there's a clear um, and massive boosting effect after um, an exposure, whether that's vaccination or infection. And, and Penny's um, studies have, have confirmed this. So, so you see by the time that um, people have had three exposures, so infection and vaccinations, called hybrid immunity. Um, everyone has a response to spike. And, and those titers are probably going up. These are not titers, these are just concentrations, uh, ODs in our assay. So we've maxed out our assay here in terms of um, boosting the, the measuring the, the boosted antibody responses. But for T cells, what you get is a plateau quite early on. And what this probably reflects is the regulatory mechanisms for T cells that prevent massive responses happening and probably the resultant pathology. So um, what we do see, so you can see the median lines here, both for CD4s and CD8s are not too different and not significantly so between one and four exposures. Um, what does change um, is the frequency of responders over time, as I showed you in the previous study. So, so um, a trend towards a much higher number of um, responders um, with more exposures, and that's the same for um, the CD8 T cells. Um, to show you this, breaking it down into the different combinations of exposures, um, you can see here now the one exposure is um, separated here into those who were vaccinated compared to those who were infected. Um, uh, we do see a slight, um, uh, a significant, significantly higher um, T cell response in these individuals. But once you get to two exposures, so that's two vaccines or a combination of infection and vaccination, um, you're seeing um, a very little difference. And again, in three exposures. So, so this just emphasizes the the real difference between antibodies and T cells in terms of their dynamics after multiple exposures and, um, and vaccinations. So just in summary for this part, um, the role of T cells in protective immunity to COVID-19 are much more challenging to study, um, but they do likely protect, provide protection from severe forms of the disease. Um, in terms of um, where we're going, um, 
there's a highly heterogeneous T cell response after infection and vaccination. We see robust T cell responses induced by both um, with prior infection, not having that much influence on the T cell response and the dynamic differing hugely between T cell responses and antibody responses. Um, so what we don't know is whether the T cell breadth increases after multiple exposures and versions of spike, and importantly, what the durability of this response is in these multiple exposures. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine now. For the second Thank you, part Wendy. Of can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And I will uh, jump, uh, jump straight to the next slide, please. Um, so the emergence of uh, successive SARS-CoV-2 variants raised an important question. Basically, are variants recognized by immune responses induced either upon vaccination or prior uh, infection? And um, as antibodies are our first line of uh, response, several labs focused on measuring the ability of neutralizing antibody to cross-react with different uh, variants, as uh, Graham uh, said earlier. And it, uh, it is now clearly established that all SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants evade neutralization um, from previous uh, infection or vaccination. And this is nicely um, illustrated by these uh, recent results from uh, Beckley's showing that convalescent sera on the left um, or Pfizer vaccine sera show reduced neutralization against all variant of concern uh, with Omicron being the most uh, resistant to uh, neutralization. So the good news is that mRNA vaccine boosters, actually the third dose, increase antibody cross-reactivity towards all variants, uh, including, including uh, Omicron. And uh, as you can see on the graph on the right, uh, neutralization activity against Omicron is restored after three doses of Pfizer or Moderna, and to a lesser extent in the JNJ vaccine is boosted uh, by Pfizer. So being T cell immunologists, we and other focused on T cell response to uh, SARS, and we ask a similar question, can vaccine induced T cells recognize a uh, SARS variant? So in a paper published earlier by uh, Traik, um, they measure CD4, which is on top of the graph on the left-hand side, and CD8 T cell response at the bottom, to um, ancestral spike in 50 vaccine recipients, and they compare and they compare the response from the ancestral spike to the response to spike to eight different uh, variants. So as you can see, T cell response were comparable regardless of the variant tested. And when calculating the fold change between ancestral and variants all medians were close to one for both CD4 and CD8 uh, responses. And this shows that actually vaccine-induced CD4 and CD8 responses cross-recognize all previous variants of concern of, or uh, variant of uh, interest. And we have done the same exercise with uh, Omicron. So we compare ancestral and Omicron T cell response in 40 vaccinees and 15 wave one convalescent patients. So we saw a modest but significant decrease in T cell response to Omicron in all tested group, but overall 70 to 80% of CD4 and CD8 response induced upon either vaccination or prior, prior infection cross-recognized Omicron. So why are our T cell uh, responses preserved uh, despite um, mutation in spike? So to try to answer this question, we measured the contribution of variable epitopes to the overall uh, spike CD4 response. To do so, we used patients infected by the ancestral virus. So PBMC was stimulated with a peptide pool covering the full ancestral spike, a small pool of peptide that contained only the beta variable epitope, but in their unmutated uh, form, or the same small pool containing this time the beta mutated version of those epitopes. So the graph show the frequency of CD4 T cell responding to the three different pools. 
And as you can see, only 12 out of the 21st wave, first wave patients, so a bit more than 50%, recognize the uh, wild type version of peptide covering mutated region. The median contribution of the wild type pool to the total spike specific CD4 response was approximately 15%, ranging from 6 to 24%. And all 12 responders actually lost recognition to the mutated version of this peptide. So this shows that mutated regions are not always immunogenic. And when recognized, they only modestly contribute to the overall response to spike. Next slide, please. So the cross-reactivity of T cell is likely due to the broad recognition of epitopes across the entire spike protein and the preferential targeting targeting of the conserved uh, region. So this is illustrated in the graph, showing that the spike mutation that are depicted in red for Omicron or in blue for Delta occur mostly in region with low recognition prevalence by CD4s. Next slide, please. So I will now like uh, shift gear um, and talk about the CD4 T cell responses in the context of other co-infection. So in country with high TB and HIV burden, the intersect of COVID, HIV, and TB raised several concerns. HIV induced profound alteration um, to the immune system with dysfunction often persisting despite antiretroviral therapy. It is thus possible that HIV could impair SARS-CoV-2 immune response, leading to unfavorable outcome. The COVID and TB interaction could uh, be even more worrying. As you all know, um, like COVID-19, TB is a respiratory, resp respiratory disease, sorry about that, eliciting hyperinflammation in the lung. And one can imagine that COVID and TB associated inflammation could have a synergistic effect where each disease is actually fueling uh, the other. Moreover, the profound lymphopenia and hyperinflammation that is induced by sever severe COVID-19 could actually fa also favor the MTB re reactivation in uh, latently infected persons. Next slide. So in fact, Marianne showed uh, quite a bit ago now that current TB and HIV infection are associated with like COVID death with a hazard ratio of like 2.7 and 2.14. However, age and uncontrolled, uncontrolled diabetes were the main risk factor for unfavorable outcome with a hazard ratio of like 11.7 and 9.7 as reported uh, worldwide. Next slide. So to study T cell response in the context of other co-infection, we use samples from 95 hospitalized uh, COVID-19 uh, patients, which were obtained during the first wave uh, of infection. And uh, this, this is the IHS cohort. The patients were grouped according to their HIV and uh, TB status. And I will just point out that the number of uh, COVID and active TB patients and the number of COVID, HIV, and TB patients were actually quite limited uh, for this uh, study. So next slide. So first, to look at the impact of uh, active TB and HIV infection on SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4 response. Oh, so yeah, we looked first at the impact of uh, active TB and HIV on SARS uh, response. So the graph here show you the frequency of uh, SARS responding CD4 cells in the four groups. And you can see that HIV or TB alone did not uh, affect the proportion on top on the pie, yeah, did not affect the proportion of a SARS-CoV-2 uh, responder. But in HIV positive and active TB positive patient, only 25% exhibited uh, SARS-CoV-2 responses. And within the responders, the magnitude of a SARS uh, response was actually comparable. So when we looked at the association between uh, CD4 count and the SARS immune response in HIV positive patient, we found that in HIV positive participants, CD4 count positively associate with the magnitude of SARS-CoV-2 T cells and also positively associate with the uh, magnitude of nucleocapsid specific IgG uh, responses. 
So this overall suggests that severe lymphopenic patient may not be able to mount an adaptive uh, response to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. So we then flip the question and ask what is the impact of COVID-19 on memory uh, MTB specific CD4 uh, responses. So to answer, answer this question, we use sample from three different cohorts, a pre-pandemic cohort that was recruited in 2018, hospitalized control. So these patients were recruited at the same time as the uh, COVID-19 patient, but they were not infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, and the COVID-19 cohort that I described uh, earlier. So each cohort was subdivided based on their HIV and uh, TB stages. And the graph shows the frequency of MTB-specific uh, CD4 cells in each subgroup. And you can see that in LTBI patients, the magnitude of MTB-specific uh, CD4 response is lower in COVID patients compared to a healthy control in the HIV-infected group. And there was also a trend of a lower response in the COVID patient who are HIV positive compared to the uh, pre-pandemic uh, cohort with a p-value of like 0.05. So um, when we look at the MTB response in the patient uh, with active TB, we didn't see any change in the frequency of MTB-specific CD4 response between healthy and uh, COVID uh, participant. So we can wonder if this decrease in MTB-specific cells is related to COVID-induced lymphopenia and if such uh, default uh, could be restored uh, after COVID uh, recovery. So next slide. So lastly, we wanted to know if uh, acute COVID infection could uh, reactivate a latent MTB infection. So we previously showed that HLADR is a very robust marker to assess TB disease activity. Indeed, HLADR is highly upregulated on MTB-specific cells of patients with active TB um, uh, disease. So the graph here shows you the expression of HLADR on MTB-specific cells in the different group. And you can see that HLADR expression is not affected by acute COVID infection in latent TB uh, infection suggesting that acute COVID does not reactivate MTB-specific uh, CD4 cells. So next slide, and to summarize, um, unlike, um, unlike neutralizing antibody, the SARS-CoV-2 T-cell response generated uh, upon vaccination or prior infection are highly cross-reactive with the variant, including Omicron. The high degree of T cell um, cross reactivity between variants is likely due to the broad recognition of epitope across the entire spike protein and the preferential targeting of the conserved region. But we still have to, uh, to determine if breakthrough infection will lead to the generation of novel T cell response ta targeting specifically the variable part of the virus. We also have to define how T cell response are maintained over time. And we also have to define whether cell-mediated, uh, in a robust way, we have to define whether cell-mediated uh, immunity contributes to the milder outcome that is observed in a breakthrough infection. So regarding the impact of a uh, co-infection on SARS-TB uh, response, we showed that control HIV uh, does not seem to sub substantially alter uh, SARS-CoV-2 CD4 responses. However, patients with advanced lymphopenia, the CD4 count that is actually lower than 100, are less able to mount a T cell or an antibody response to SARS-CoV-2. We also showed that during acute uh, COVID, the frequency of MTB-specific cells is reduced compared to pre-pandemic, but COVID doesn't, uh, does not lead to a reactivation, as shown by the lack of upregulation of HLADR um, on these cells. But uh, as I was uh, saying earlier, uh, we still need to define whether those profiles will normalize upon uh, COVID recovery uh, or if this could actually constitute a long-term risk uh, for MTB control in the patient who had COVID before. Next slide, but I guess it's my last slide. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, we don't need the additional data yet. <laughs> So I guess both Wendy and myself, if there's time, I'm ready to, uh, to take some questions.
Thanks very much, uh, Wendy and Catherine, for, for a really brilliant overview um, and, and you know, highlighting so many important aspects of this interaction of T-cells and COVID um, and, and making it accessible for, for non-immunologists. So really uh, very grateful for the talk this afternoon. There is time for questions. Um, and at, I, I see there are a few in the chat that I'll, I'll um, refer to Wendy uh, Spearman to, to ask, but if I could just um, ask a, a, a kind of speculative question to start off with, and that is, you know, obviously there is concern that variants will arise that will completely evade immune responses. And in, in your opinion, is, is there a, a, a very low likelihood that there would be a variant that would arise that would uh, escape all T cell responses from prior infection and, and vaccination? Uh, or is, is there a, a substantial risk of, of that occurring? Obviously, it, you know, it's a speculative question, but just from, from the work that you've done. Uh, Wendy, do you want to take that one? Do you want me to take that one? No, go ahead. <laughs> so the fact that actually most of T cells, so, so as I was showing on that graph, that the fact that uh, T cells are a Immunogen immunogenic domina like all across spike protein and also the N and the M protein uh, is actually quite reassuring in the fact that uh, lo lots of these regions are actually not uh, variable and uh, not able to, uh, to mutate. However, depending on the pa each patient HLA uh, type, you know, HLA, uh, um, the, the HLA they are carrying, sorry. Mm. Uh, we, we can imagine that as much as like so many epitopes can, uh, can be recognized, but within each individual, that, that number of epitopes that would be recognized would narrow based on your, the HLA that you're yeah, carrying. Mm. And we can imagine so that in some patients, there might be um, an escape that could be quite substantial if, uh, if the mutation occur on the specific epitope recognized by specific HLA that the patient is carrying. But mm -hmm. overall, uh, there, there might still be like preservation due to like, uh, you know, like promiscuity of CD4 uh, epitopes and uh, stuff like that. I think T cell response are, will be more robust than the antibody response. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was very clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so then um, if, if, if we can pick up on some of the questions, Wendy, Wendy Spearman. Yeah, so there are a couple of questions uh, from Barry Bloom. Do you have any evidence whether trained innate immunity has any impact on COVID? Our first question. Um, we haven't looked at that at all, um, and I, I'm not sure there's any evidence from the literature. Catherine, do you know of any? I don't. Yeah, like I don't know if there's anything in the literature. I haven't followed the innate uh, literature very closely. But the point is taken that we're, we're assuming it can only be antibodies and T cells, but there are um, um, other mechanisms um, or neutralization in T cells, but there are certainly other mechanisms that can be contributing to um, protection from severe disease. Then we've got a couple from Tom Schriever uh, asking, was it correct that MTB specific T cells were activated in COVID-19 cases without signs of TB disease? And could this indicate subclinical TB in those with COVID? Uh, yes, Tom, you're right. Actually, you, you looked at the graph uh, closely. I can, I can tell there was two patients, one patient actually uh, in the COVID-19 uh, group who had like an in, incredibly high level of HLAD on uh, MTB response. And uh, we, we could suspect uh, uh, subclinical TB here, but unfortunately we don't have any uh, evidence, you know, sputum to actually back that up. But uh, it, it's a possibility. But I can't tell if it was like a TB uh, episode that was uh, pr prior COVID, or if it was uh, if it was like actually triggered by COVID. And then there's another question: um, Any signs of T cell exhaustion in the study of multiple exposures, vaccines, or infections? Yeah, I, we haven't looked specifically at exhaustion or um, regulatory markers, but it's clear that there is immune regulation because we're not seeing the response going up and up. So I think, you know, just from that fact, that there must be some some very, very important regulatory mechanisms. I, so I, from because they're in, it's acute infection, I doubt that there's going to be exhaustion, but I think it is important that we interrogate what those um, regulatory mechanisms are. We've done a, a collaborative 
study with Al Leslie, who's looked at B cell memory. And he made a really interesting observation that in older individuals, there does seem to be some exhaustion in their memory B cells. And it's something that we're following up. So, so there might be some mechanisms at play in certain groups, um, but we've not um, specifically looked, and I don't expect there would be. I think this is more like a situation where, you know, where we've all been um, exposed to flu multiple times and multiple flu vaccines. And this is just how it's going to be from now on where you have this, these are acute infections and you have this really complex history of exposure going forward. And, and just to add to that, uh, Tom, we didn't look at a full panel of like uh, inhibitory receptor, but uh, we looked at PD-1. And uh, obviously in acute infection, acute COVID infection, PD-1 was extremely high on both CD4 and CD8 T cells. But we also found actually a surprisingly high level of PD-1 in convalescent patient. So it would be interesting to actually follow them up. And I guess those patients were like a month and a half after recovery. It would be interesting to actually follow them up a bit longer to see if actually the PD-1 uh, level actually decreased or if those cells actually could have some sign of immune modulation. I wouldn't call exhaustion, but at least being immune modulated. But uh, it was quite surprising to see such level of PD-1. But we didn't look at other, other immune um, immunitary uh, receptors like TIM3 or, or you know, CTLA4 and stuff like that. So it would be very, a very interesting study to do. Um, and then I think there's another. Um, do you have any comments on the lack of robust CD8 responses you are seeing? Do other viral infections have the same impact? And what impact could this have for immunity? I mean, I wouldn't call it a lack of robust CD8 responses. You know, I, I think we see something similar with flu and other respiratory infections, and, and perhaps the CD8 response does need to be more kept in check. Um, but um, so, so, yeah, so I, I would say I think they are robust. I think what we don't know is the breadth of the response. So how many epitopes are being targeted and how we might perhaps in some people increase um, the breadth of the response, or whether the breadth of the response increases over time, um, so that um, uh, immune escape is is not an issue. For example, if you're targeting one epitope versus four epitopes, it's much more likely that your immune response might be escaped if you only target one epitope. So, so I think there there is um, room for exploring next generation vaccines and there are already some that include other immunodominant structural proteins like nucleocapsid along with spike so that's an important target of cd8 responses um, and and that might be something because we know that nucleocapsid also doesn't have all the same mutations or mutational pressure that spike does so i hope that answers you neri um, Graham, i think we've covered all the Okay. I've, I've, thanks, Wendy. I've got one additional question, and that's just to pick up on the, the um, issue of uh, cross reactivity, T cell cross reactivity with, with other coronaviruses. And obviously, it's, it's something that there's been kind of um, variable data uh, over the last two years on that issue. And just your view as to whether there was, you think that there was any substantial evidence of protection. Um, from, from prior infections with, with other coronaviruses and whether that might have influenced disease severity prior to initial infection and, and, and vaccination. I um, guess the issue, the issue here is like, uh, we'd, uh, the, the quick answer is like, we don't know. And uh, now it's gonna be very complicated to test because most people have been infected with SARS. And, uh, and unless you go back to like uh, stored, you know, uh, historical samples, find cross-reactive response and follow those people to see if they had COVID or not, mm -hmm. um, it, it's going to be very, very complicated to, uh, but just be, be, there is cross, pre-existing cross-reactive uh, responses. And we can imagine that these T cell might play a bit of a role in protecting at least against severe disease. But the problem is like we don't know we don't know the correct of protection uh, for SARS-CoV-2. We don't know which type of T cells is, is uh, necessary. Is it CD4, CD8? Probably a combination of, 
of both. What is the level of T cell that you need? Because magnitude is probably important. So there's all those factors that need to be taken into account before saying, you know, having a cross pre-existing cross-reactive response would be enough to actually protect you from, uh, mm. from SARS. But it's almost an impossible study to do now. Mm -hmm. Wendy, your thoughts on yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you know, certainly the crush reactive immunity from other coronas might be influencing this massive heterogeneity you see between people, um, but um, whether that's contributing to protection, we don't know yet. Some yeah. studies say yes, some studies say no. <laughs> so, Yeah, so, so it's, it's probably one of those questions that, as you say, given the current scenario that we won't be able to answer definitively. Um, are, there, are, there, are there additional questions coming up, Wendy? They are. Um, there's a question. Has anyone looked at elderly individuals and seen if their T cell responses plateau um, as your data does? So, in the elderly, does the, the T cell responses plateau? So we, we, we don't know yet, but uh, Wendy, you can talk about the next study, you know, like uh, stratifying based on like a uh, group, including elderly. Yeah, so we have a really great study that we're crunching through the data at the moment. Um, it's a sub study of the Sasanke um, uh, trial where we've um, performed T cell analyses in um, almost 400 people um, divided into older healthcare workers, those with uh, living with HIV, those with comorbidities, and a couple of other groups, pregnant, breastfeeding, and so on, compared to, to younger, healthy healthcare workers with, with none of those conditions. And I think there we, for the first time, because up to now we've been looking at younger, healthy um, healthcare workers, we'll be able to look at the immune response after vaccination and the combination of infection and vaccination and be able to address some of those issues around age and these other conditions, um, comorbidities and so on. So we've not looked at it, but it's gonna be very interesting to, to look at that and, and look at some of those issues around immune exhaustion in an, in an elderly vaccinated population. And then I think there's one last um, uh, question. Uh, does this mean that we can get away with less frequent boosting after free exposures, or is, are we still complicated by lack of known correlation of protection? So, can we get away with less frequent boosting? I mean, I think for the antibody response, we are not going to be getting, be able to get away from frequent boosting or boosting with variant specific vaccines in the future, perhaps. Um, and also for T cell responses, we don't know the durability. So, so these are generally quite short term studies and we, we measure the T cell responses one month or at most six months after the last exposure. So I think there's still so much unknown. Um, it's more likely that there are many boosters in our future than not, whether that's from infection or vaccination. Okay, so um, really just to say thanks once again to, to Wendy and Catherine for an excellent session, to Marianne for her input on the epidemiology. I think it's been a really enlightening session and picking up on a, on a key issue uh, in COVID, the, the role of T cells. Um, and, uh, and to say that we will be having um, hopefully another COVID webinar in two weeks time. We're planning for that and we'll send out um, an advert regarding that once we've confirmed with the speaker. So thanks uh, to the audience for attending this afternoon and um, hopefully see you again in two weeks time. Thanks very well. Bye everybody.